Our next speaker will be Ryan Tipsharani. Ryan is from Carnegie Mellon University, and he'll be speaking on epidemiological forecasting tools for COVID-19. Yeah, thanks for, for the intro. Um, my name is Ryan Tipsharani. I'm a faculty in statistics and in machine learning at Carnegie Mellon University. I work with a group um, that Roni Rosenfeld and I uh, co-lead at Carnegie Mellon called Delphi. Uh, we are one of the CDC's two centers of excellence for flu forecasting. Um, and I, I recently became an Amazon scholar. So just a, a quick note before I begin, um, I am not a uh, public health expert. I am a statistician who has been thrown headfirst into what has been a, uh, an exciting uh, and, a, and a kind of extremely challenging uh, effort in, in pandemic forecasting with the CDC. Um, so just, just take that as, as my background as I describe kind of where I'm coming from and what we're doing. Uh, so first I wanted to just tell you a little bit about um, the efforts we've been doing for many years, which are very relevant to what we're doing now. Um, we've been working on flu, flu forecasting at Carnegie Mellon and the Delphi Group um, for about six or seven years. Um, influenza is a major uh, global public health problem. It's associated with uh, between 250 and 500,000 deaths each year, as estimated by the World Health Organization. Uh, and in the US, it's typically between 30 and 60,000, but we do have um, bad seasons, like for example, the worst season in recent memory was the 2017-18 season in which the CDC estimates about 80,000 uh, flu-related flu deaths occurred. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this at Carnegie Mellon since about 2013. And uh, interestingly, what, what prompted us to begin this was that the CDC has, has uh, at that year, begun a forecasting challenge every year for seasonal influenza. There are about 40 systems that participate uh, in recent years. Each one of these systems is put forth by typically an academic unit, but there are also some in, units in industry who participate. Um, this is kind of completely community oriented. There's no compensation, obviously. We are all doing it for the purpose of advancing science. Um, why does the CDC care? They care because forecasts of seasonal influenza can help them essentially with preparedness and countermeasures. So things like planning vaccination campaigns, um, figuring out if we can get the forecasts to be granular enough, granular enough spatially, figuring out how to better staff hospitals, um, free up hospital beds, free up ventilators, et cetera. Um, our group has had the highest accuracy forecasts uh, every year, except for the last year, in which case we had the second highest accuracy forecasts, and we, were, we became a center of excellence uh, last year. So um, let me tell you about what flu forecasting looks like, uh, and then I will tell you why it's so relevant to what, what is happening right now. So the, mo the most basic target that the CDC cares about is called ILI, influenza-like illness. And they care about the percentage, um, essentially, of uh, visits to a hospital or a doctor in the U.S., um, uh, the percentage of, of such visits in which a patient reports uh, these, these symptoms. So this is a clinical diagnosis. It's not confirmed by a laboratory test. And why do they care about this? This is believed to be a leading indicator of flu burden. So, for example, if we see ILI go up, then, you know, we, we, we may believe that in a number of days or weeks, we'll see an increased burden in terms of hospitalizations. And there are, there's lots of literature that supports this. This is the CDC's at this point, kind of most basic unit of interest. And so what I'm plotting through here is, is national um, level ILI uh, across the years 1997 through, through this year. So I actually generated this plot, you know, maybe a couple minutes before we started. This is the most recent data we have in terms of influenza-like illness. And the CDC started doing this in, in 1997. So that's as far back as we go. And so you can see, of course, um, very clear seasonality as we go from year to year. Uh, this was the year of the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And if you look carefully, you can see a very different seasonality. And, and at the very end, you can see um, what's happening this year. And if you squint carefully, you can see that we have a very abnormal behavior in terms of ILI. And I'll, I'll kind of revisit, revisit that in just a couple of minutes. So some notes, um, the CDC collects ILI at the state level, not just nationally, but for each state. Importantly, every data point that we get from the CDC is one week old. It's available weekly, but it's dated by a week because of um, the a delay that kind of, you know, the CDC takes to aggregate and, and collect and release the data. And the data is subject to revisions, so sometimes significant ones, because doctors turn in, um, let's say, reports late, and this is actually informative. It's not a missing at random type process. So why does the CDC care about ILI? Here's another way to look at it. Um, if you think about the severity pyramid, and this is a CDC figure, then uh, this is getting at syndromatic illness or, or symptomatic illnesses, the syndromatic surveillance. And, you know, there's obviously a clear relationship between that and hospitalizations and hospitalizations and deaths. 
And so, of course, observation is important at every level of the pyramid. And you, you might imagine that the pyramid is actually much more complicated this, than this for, for flu. And it's significantly much more complicated than this for coronavirus, um, which is what I'm going to get to in just a minute. So let me tell you about um, what specifically we forecast. Um, we, we forecast for the CDC the next four weeks of percentage ILI in every state. We forecast long-term targets, which is when is the worst week going to be and what is the peak value of percentage ILI going to be and how long is the season going to last. And predictions are repeated every week as new data comes in. And we do the same for hospitalizations. So this is currently what the kind of CDC flu forecasting challenges look like each year. So how to um, forecast new seasonal epidemics? Let me just give you some very high-level points. I'm trying to convey somehow why this is None of this is appropriate for pandemic forecasting. So th this is kind of the, the point of contrast I want to make. So first, you have to choose a model class. And the two basic classes of models are mechanistic and statistical models. The difference is that mechanistic models try to mo model the underlying kind of latent mechanism of the disease, typically based off of kind of epidemiological uh, differential equation models. Like the, the simplest one would be the SIR, or susceptible infected recovered model. Statistical models model observables, so they don't deal with latent variables, at least not those that are kind of have biological meaning, and they're kind of a direct phenomenological model of observables. So our group works on statistical models, um, and I'm going to mostly comment on what kind of epidemiological forecasting will look like for those. Some of the key elements are to collect lots of data uh, and proxies like um, what I would call digital surveillance data, which is similar to things that were mentioned by you know, previous speakers. Um, flu New Year, for, flu New Year, for example, as, as John Brownstein mentioned, would be like a terrific one proxy. minute. Um, and uh, you know, some other keys are that you know we, you have to really kind of carefully handle non-stationarity because each season is a little bit different. So let me tell you why none of this is appropriate for for forecasting a pandemic. And I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Um, the 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 kind of key element here is distribution shift. So what we're observing now is nothing like we've observed with historical flu. And by definition of the pandemic, it's nothing like what we've observed, period. And so um, what not to do is just to kind of continue to run the same forecasting systems. And so the CDC pulled the plug on the forecasting challenge this year, just started a new challenge in which we predict the same targets, ILI and hospitalizations, because the, the simplest clinical picture of coronavirus meets the kind of same clinical picture as flu. So let me tell you about the current landscape. I'm running out of time. Um, the current landscapes that the CDC has continued the forecasting exercise this year has just switched essentially over to focus on coronavirus, but, but considering the same targets. And the two center, center, centers of excellence, ours and another one, are helping kind of serve as advisors to this effort in which we are building an ensemble of community forecasts from about 20 teams that are participating. One of the hardest things we're facing this year is uh, the kind of requirement of using counterfactual reasoning. So we want to kind of ask models to escape confounders and produce scenario projections, which is going to be extremely important for policymakers. So my very last thing I'll say is that what you can do is that you can take symptom surveys like the one that John Brownstein measured, mentioned and, and any, any of the ones you see, because we actually really value that data. And you can join in our crowdcasting effort, which is separate from what I've talked about, but I put a link there. So thank you. And I'm sorry that I ran uh, close over time. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was really uh, interesting and it's good to see the repurposing of previous efforts for the current challenges.